In this episode, a young woman is on holiday in Hawaii. As she snorkels in the beautiful waters, 100 yards from the beach, her arm is torn from her body in a ferocious shark attack. As she struggles about at the surface, a high school teacher hears her desperate screams for help and dives in. Only when he's within feet of the injured tourist does he realize the danger he's put himself in. Surrounded by a cloud of blood, carrying her flailing body in his arms, is he next on the shark's menu? Hit like and subscribe. This is Fierce. 20 year old Jana Luderop had left her West Germany home to work as an au pair in the Seattle suburb of Issaquah. She spent her time looking after four year old twins and their five year old brother. But after a year on the job, she booked a vacation to Hawaii. She left Seattle in August and planned to return to Germany in September. She and her friends headed to Palauea Beach in McKenna on the Hawaiian island of Maui. Also known as White Rock Beach, it's less busy than some of Maui's hot spots. The Golden Sands are flanked by volcanic rock. To the north side, there is excellent snorkeling with rock pools for those less inclined to enter the water. Sea turtles frequent the area and colorful sea life clings to the volcanic rocks. The beach gently slopes into the water, making it a popular swimming spot for locals, but it's often regarded as a relatively unused beach by visitors. With less crowds, it feels like a little piece of paradise, away from the hustle and bustle of the large towns, away from the throng of tourists. On Wednesday, August 14, 2013, Yana entered the warm water. The water was choppy, little wavelets formed on the surface. She pulled a mask and snorkel over her face, slipped into her fins, and dipped her face into the ocean. Beneath the surface, visibility was poor, but brightly colored fish darted everywhere. It was a beautiful wildlife haven. But Yana wasn't alone. The tranquil underwater scene was about to change. The peace and beauty were about to become a scene from a nightmare, a bloodbath. A shark homed in on the shallows, scouring the ocean for a meal an opportunistic hunter. It spotted Yana swimming at the surface. She was 100 yards from shore. She didn't see the shark approaching. It came at her with terrific speed, torpedoing upwards. It struck her from below. The hit knocked the air from Yana's lungs as she flew into the air. Disoriented, Yana scrambled about in the water, and then she felt a firm tug on her arm. She looked to her side, and a shark had her whole arm in its jaws. The nose of the shark was just inches from Yana's face. She looked right into the shark's eyes. The pressure in her arm built until it felt like it would snap, and then shockingly, it did. The shark severed Yana's arm from her body. Blood poured into the ocean. Yana screamed for help. The shark submerged below the surface. Frantically, Yana kicked and kicked, trying to make it to shore. She was losing blood rapidly. She didn't think she was going to make it. The attack had been too brutal, too forceful. Her group of friends could see her splashing about in the water, and they cried out, but none of them dared to go into the water to save her. 57-year-old Rick Moore, who was vacationing from California with his friend Nicholas Grisafi, heard a blood-curdling scream from the beach. The two men turned around and looked out to sea. They could see Yana struggling a hundred yards out. She was surrounded in a sea of red. Without hesitating, Rick ran into the water. He swam as fast as he could right into the middle of the cloud of blood. Less than 10 feet from the young German, he noticed her arm was missing. It had been torn completely off. He told her to grab hold of him with her other arm as he supported her head. Then swimming on his back toward the shore, he kicked for dry land. It was slow but steady progress. As he tried to calm Yana, it suddenly dawned on him just how much danger he had put himself in. The shark was still in the area. He was carrying wounded prey, surrounded by blood. He could have been attacked by the shark at any time. Other sharks could have been drawn to the area, enticed by the smell of fresh blood. Still, he kicked, continuing to progress toward dry land. All the while, Yana was terrified she was going to die. She kept repeating it over and over telling Rick that she wasn't going to make it. I'm dying, she said. I know I'm going to die. Rick tried to reassure her, but he knew that with each passing second, the young woman's chances of survival were fading. He prayed out loud to God, 
He prayed for protection from the shark. He prayed that they made it to shore safely. He was worried that at any second he would see the telltale sign of a shark, its fin slicing through the water towards them, a sharp tug on his legs as it dragged him underwater. But he was determined to make it, determined to get to dry land. When they were close to the beach, Rick's friend Nicholas waded into the shallows. The water came up to his neck, and he took Yana from Rick and pulled her onto the beach. She was drifting in and out of consciousness. She had lost so much blood that it no longer poured from her open wound. As they laid Yana down on the sand, 23-year-old Joshua Craddock from London called the emergency services. He had watched the whole rescue. He was awestruck by Rick's bravery as the man had dived into the blood-stained water. They lifted Yana onto a makeshift stretcher, a beachgoer's kayak, and carried her up the trail to the street. Yana's friends did nothing to help the situation. They were understandably in a state of shock, but they left it up to strangers and passers-by to help their friend. They cried as they watched their bikini-clad friend pulled from the sea, covered in blood and missing an arm. When they arrived at the street, a police officer tied a tourniquet around Yana's shoulder. She was barely conscious by this point. Her breaths became shallow, her heartbeat faint. Then she stopped breathing. Immediately, high school teachers Rick and Nicholas began performing CPR. Yana's friends just stood there watching until an ambulance arrived and rushed Yana to Maui Memorial Medical Center. Rick and Nicholas visited her at the medical center two days later. Doctors told them that she was in stable condition. It looked like Yana might make it, but two days later, she became critically ill and was placed on life support. Tragically, Yana lost her fight one week after the attack. Despite doctors' best efforts, she didn't survive. Her family spoke of the enthusiastic, happy young woman that Yana was. She was beautiful and strong and will always be remembered laughing. Rick and Nicholas reflected on the attack. They replayed the ordeal over and over in their minds. They prayed for Yana's recovery. Nicholas wonders whether he had done enough. He questions whether he should have swum out to help Rick bring Yana in. Maybe he should have pulled on his fins and helped pull her to shore. She would have made it to dry land quicker, saving precious time. Nicholas said that the attack has affected him. He still goes into the water, but he won't stray far from the beach. It was a terrible thing to have happened to someone so young, and for those involved in the rescue, it'll likely remain vivid in their memory for the rest of their lives. It was May 21st, 2023 in New Jersey. As the spring weather began to heat up, young surfer Maggie Drozdowski took to the sea with her friend Sarah O'Donnell. After strapping their surfboards to their legs, the pair jogged into the water and paddled out from the shore at 110th Street Beach in Stone Harbor. It was a glorious sunny afternoon, perfect for catching some waves, but their surfing trip was about to take a sinister turn. Stone Harbor on New Jersey's southern tip attracts thousands of visitors each year. Situated 30 miles south of Atlantic City, visitors are drawn to the white sandy beaches, the sailing excursions, boutique downtown shops, and the promise of excellent surf. Maggie and her family had traveled from Chester County in Pennsylvania, 90 miles northwest of the harbor. The surf was good. The two 15-year-old friends were enjoying the rush of the waves and the freedom of the great outdoors. But the pair wasn't alone. As they rode the waves, something lurked beneath the surface. A predator was on the prowl. It honed in on the two girls, investigating as it came closer and closer. Suddenly, a large wave knocked Maggie from her board. She fell into the water. When she surfaced, she looked around for her surfboard and grabbed hold of it. Her body and legs dangled in the water as she tried to pull herself back on board. But before she could do so, she felt it. Something large grabbed hold of her left foot. She didn't realize what it was at first, but it was strong and powerful. It had her in its grip and pulled her underwater. Unable to take a breath of air, Maggie's lungs felt as though they were going to burst. The pressure on her lower leg grew as she tried to kick the animal off, frantically shaking her leg and kicking with the other. Terrified, Maggie screamed under the waves, bubbles escaping from her mouth as she fought for the surface. Looking up, she could see shards of sunlight penetrating the water. 
She reached upwards, desperately trying to pull herself to safety, but she kept being pulled downwards. She kept kicking her leg, furiously trying to break free, but the creature held on. It felt like an eternity, but miraculously, she felt her foot pull free, free from the jaws of a shark, and she kicked for the surface. When she felt the cool air on her face, she gasped and took in a deep breath. She yelled at her friend Sarah, who paddled over. She splashed about in the sea, panicking and shouting that she had been bitten by something. Sarah told her to get on her board immediately and paddle to shore. Maggie climbed onto her surfboard, lying flat and pulling at the water with her hands. A trail of blood leaked from Maggie's torn foot, a trail that enticed sharks nearby. A tantalizing scent spilling into the ocean behind the two girls. Together, they inched towards the beach. With every minute that passed, Maggie's adrenaline surged. Was it still out there? Was it following them? Were they going to make it back to the shore? With her foot out of action, Maggie didn't manage to catch a single wave into shore. Instead, she paddled the whole way. The progress was slow. The beach never seemed to get any closer. Her arms were aching. Salt water stung her eyes, but she was focused. Focused on getting out of the water as quickly as possible. She didn't know how badly damaged her foot was. She hadn't taken the time to investigate. That didn't matter right now. It was an agonizing four minutes of frantic paddling before they made it to the shallows and jumped off their boards. They ran out of the sea and sat down on the beach, breathing heavily. They had made it. They had survived what they were soon to realize was a shark attack. Sarah didn't realize the seriousness of her friend's injury. She assumed Maggie had been pinched by a crab or something. It never crossed her mind that it could be a shark and that it could have been a very different ending. But when they inspected Maggie's injury, they realized just how lucky they had been. It suddenly dawned on the two girls that it had been a shark that had bitten Maggie's foot. But what kind of shark and what size, they will never know. They never saw the animal. There was no sign of it in the water. No warning and no time to prepare for the attack. Sharks often test out their prey by biting it first. Only then do they realize that humans aren't their typical prey and they move off. But all too often, that first bite can be fatal, usually due to the blood loss the victim suffers. Only once they were out of the water and on the safety of the land did Maggie start to feel the pain from her injury. The deep gashes began to sting, her lower leg throbbed. They needed to get medical help as soon as possible. Infection can spread rapidly throughout the body following a shark bite. The two girls wrapped the foot up in a towel before Sarah helped Maggie hobble back across the beach with her surfboard. They made it back to her family, who was nearby. Deep lacerations covered her foot and calf. Blood oozed from the open wounds and spilled onto the sand. The blood flow was so great that Maggie feared she may lose her foot. She didn't know the extent of the damage. They called emergency services and volunteer firefighters were the first responders to arrive on the scene. They began dressing Maggie's foot, trying to apply pressure to reduce the blood loss. She was then lifted onto an ATV and driven across the sand, before being transferred via ambulance to Cape Regional Medical Center. Once she was there, she received six stitches to close up her wounds. Although Maggie and Sarah didn't see the shark, the New Jersey State Southern Regional Medical Examiner said the injuries were consistent with a shark bite. Having survived the attack, Maggie has said that she is afraid to enter the water again. She knows how lucky she is to have survived, but it'll be a while before she paddles back out on her surfboard again. For a short while after the attack, Maggie moved about on crutches with her foot still heavily bandaged. She wanted to share her story in the hope of raising awareness to other beachgoers and surfers who entered the water. Her attack came just days after two men were bitten while fishing in the Florida Keys. The beaches along Stone Harbor weren't closed following Maggie's attack, but officials warned people to be extra vigilant and to take precautions, such as removing reflective jewelry and avoiding swimming in or near fishing areas. Shark attacks in New Jersey are incredibly rare. Since records began, there have only been 16 documented attacks in the state, with the previous attack happening back in 2006. 
In fact, Gavin Naylor, the director of the Florida Program for Shark Research, said that you're 200 times more likely to drown than you are to be bitten by a shark. As far as shark attacks go in the United States, Florida is the shark bite capital of the world.